People would say, oh, well, that's a way of capturing truth, cinema verite, cinema of truth. But don't for a minute think that it's objective. I'm standing in a particular place. The camera is doing particular things, and there is a point of view there expressed. I'm here to introduce an old friend, uh, Gordon Quinn. Um, Gordon is the artistic director and founding member of Kartemkin Films. Gordon Quinn's been making documentaries for over 45 years uh, and advocating very strongly for them as well uh, almost all that time. Um, with uh, Home for Good Life, Gordon established the direction that he would take for the next four decades, making cinema verite films, films from life, that investigate and critique society uh, by documenting the unfolding lives of real people, uh, not the people you often see on television. Uh, at Kartemkin, Gordon created a legacy that is an inspiration for young filmmakers and a home where they can make high quality social issue documentaries. Uh, Kartemkin's best known film, Hoop Dreams 1994, executive produced by Gordon, was released theatrically to unprecedented critical acclaim. Uh, the film has won a number of awards, and I don't need to go into too many details since we're here in Chicago. We know Hoop Dreams pretty well. Um, other films Gordon's made include uh, Vietnam, Long Time Coming, Golub, Five Girls, Refrigerator Mothers, Stevie. Uh, Gordon executive produced Mapping Stem Cell Research, Terra Incognita, and The New Americans. Uh, his list goes on and on. Another interesting list I see on this biography is the people that have associated with Gordon and Kartemkin over the years. There's, go, go to the Kartemkin Films uh, website and look at that list of filmmakers. It's on there. I think this man has done probably more or as much as anyone in this town to uh, nurture documentary makers and, as I said before, advocate for their rights and needs of uh, underserved groups. Um, so. Uh, I will let Gordon continue here. Uh, he's, uh, there's a lot of things that weren't on this biography list. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people might not even be aware of is that he advocated quite strongly for the creation of what's called independent television service. He testified before Congress and uh, somehow got that through. Uh, and that provides funding, additional funding, uh, for independent filmmaking. And he's been active recently working on uh, a, a trying to get an independent documentaries in better scheduled time slots. So without any ado, I will introduce Gordon. Come on up and talk. Actually, I, I, I like to begin with a clip. So this is a seven-hour series that we did on immigration. And I'm going to show this clip. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about it a little bit, and, but I'm going to want to know what you think of this clip. What do you think this clip is saying? So here it is. Uh, this little boy is leaving his school to emigrate to America for the first, you know, with his parents. And he's leaving the only world he's ever known. Él estuvo aquí con ustedes, ¿verdad? Pero ustedes estaban de primero y él iba de segundo. Ya se fue a despedir de sus compañeros. Y él ya se va a Estados Unidos, se va con toda su familia y se viene a despedir. Y se fijan que está triste, ¿verdad? Porque ya se va. Porque él estuvo muy a gusto aquí con nosotros. ¿Y si tienes ganas de irte? No. ¿No tienes ganas de irte? Pero ya cuando estés allá te va a gustar. Ahorita, no, ahorita dices no tengo ganas de irme porque no conoces. Muchas gracias, maestro, porque qué, usted me enseñó. A escribir y a saber una letra. Ay, Pedrito, ya. <risa> ya me... Muchas gracias, ya, mi hijito, ¿no? ¿Eh? Oh, Dios. Sí, mi hijito. Pues ya también me hiciste llorar a mí, mi hijito, de que te vaya muy bien. Espero que nos vuelvamos a ver más. Sí, hijo, a ver cuánto vuelves, ¿eh? A lo mejor ya cuando estés bien grandote vas a volver, ya no te voy a conocer. <risa> Ándale, pues, que te vaya bien, mi hijito. A ver, vamos a darle un aplauso a Pedrito porque ya se va.
But so I'm, I'm just curious, what are some things that people think are going on in that scene that's uh, just one little moment, about a minute and 15 seconds from a seven-hour TV series that follows a whole, a different families coming from different parts of the world uh, to emigrate to America? This is what media literacy really is. Uh, it's being able to read, uh, especially for a documentary, what's really happening in a scene. And for me, you guys said it, this is what's really happening here. Which, and it's something that most Americans have trouble understanding, which is that people who emigrate to America don't necessarily want to come here. They have to come here. And they're leaving something incredibly valuable behind when they leave. And one of the things that we wanted to do in this series was to deal with something that usually doesn't get covered in the media. We spent, in some cases, a year with people in their home countries. We were looking for people who weren't sitting there with their bags packed, ready to, ready to come. We wanted the American audience to see the life that they left behind. And, you know, you, you see a lot of things in this, in this piece. This is a, the school may not have windows and it has uh, a dirt floor, but that's a good teacher. You know that. You feel it emotionally. And so in documentary, the kind of documentaries we make, we try to use emotion to get to people, to kind of draw people in who may not be sub sympathetic to the issue that we're looking at in our film. And our kind of founding statement, and I anyone who's heard me speak before has heard this quote from John Dewey. It's from The Public and Its Problems. And it's kind of like what founded Cartemquin some 46 years ago. Artists have always been the real purveyors of the news, for it is not the outward happening in itself which is new, but the kindling by it of emotion, perception, and appreciation. So we believe that the way to help people to sort of change their thinking is to engage them uh, on, a, uh, on an emotional level. But we are living in strange times, um, and media literacy is more important uh, than ever. And I'm going to talk a little bit about media li literacy and then I'm going to talk about documentary ethics because journalism has one set of ethics, documentary filmmaking has another set of ethics, and I think even art making should have uh, ethical concerns. And it's sort of understanding what it means to make something from an ethical perspective that I think can give people uh, a window into what how to help people understand what's being looked at in the media. And I'm going to share with you a story that happened a, a couple months ago. We are doing a film called uh, as, as so, And So Goes Janesville. And it's about Wisconsin. It's about Janesville uh, and the county that it's in where a major GM plant uh, shut down and the effect on the local economy was devastating. And we're co-producing this film with Brad Lichtenstein, who lives in Wisconsin, and Leslie Simmer at Cartemquin is editing it. As we follow the story, you see things like, you know, you guys probably heard about Scott Walker, the governor who's trying to end collective bargaining, and you see, uh, you know, while we're making the film is when he got elected. Uh, one of the 24 state representatives who fled to Illinois when they were trying to ram that through was Tim Cullen. One, one, he's, a, he's a character that we meet when he's, after 20 years out of the state legislator, he's, legislature, he's decided to run again. And you meet him when he's knocking on doors, uh, deciding to run and, and running his campaign. And he was one of the few uh, Democrats who won in the midterm uh, elections, uh, in the election where Scott Walker c came in. So um, we're meeting with people who are going to be working around this film. 
And the film raises a lot of issues. It raises a lot of issues about economics. It raises a lot of issues about values and education. Uh, it follows unemployed workers who are now, not unemployed, but workers who have to choose between being unemployed or commuting to Indiana to work in another Janesville, in another GM plant, because their union protects them and they're able to, to, to get another job, you know, a job in another plant. Um, and we also have a banker in the film. And those of you who follow, uh, you know, if you, if you see things blowing up on YouTube or something, the recent clip of Scott Walker talking to this billionaire lady, and she's saying, you know, you're terrific, and, you know, you know can't we get this uh, state to be a right-to-work state? And Scott Walker says, yes, you know, she says, can't we get this to be a red state, you know? And he's saying, yes, that's, that's where we're going, but first we have to divide and conquer. And it's gotten a lot of play. It's been picked up by the media, and that's from this film. It's actually uh, one of our characters was had to have a microphone on. He's standing there as they're talking to Walker, and you, he could see the camera, but wasn't paying attention. So it's <laughs> it's become a big, a big thing. But when we're meeting, we're having an outreach about how the film is going to be used to create social impact. We're talking about, uh, you know, with some of the people in Wisconsin who are going to be working with it. And I had been pushing during the making of the film. I said, you know, we have these characters, the story's very character driven, but I wanted some data in the film. I just wanted some, just a few facts, you know, like how much people actually make in an auto plant and, uh, you know, what the unemployment rates are, just some data that would be kind of like another layer of meaning in the film. And getting resistance here and there, and I, I brought this up in this meeting, and the guy who's in charge of the, the outreach said, you know, if we put data into the movie, if we put that kind of hard information into the movie, people will perceive it as biased. And he saw the look on my face, you know, and he sort of said, oh, no, 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 don't get me wrong. You know, I'm, you know, I'm uh, work with the UAW and, you know, I'm fighting against Scott Walker. He says, but that's the reality of the world we, we live in. Uh, and I think to some extent it is, you know, for many years, I have talked about uh, the, the so-called liberal bias of, of the media. And I think, though, that the people who perceive it, I think what they're perceiving and what they don't like, I always called reporting. <laughs> That's really what the liberal bias of the media is. I mean, if you look at a paper like the Tribune, and if you read, and I get the Tribune, uh, because it's still a newspaper and it still has reporters, and if you read the editorial page, you wouldn't think that the people who write those editorials, once in a while they have something, but most of the time the editorials seem to be, how could they write that editorial? Don't they read their own paper? Don't they read what the reporters are reporting and the reporters are saying? I don't know if people saw it a few weeks ago. They had an incredible two or three part series on flame retardant and the whole con scandal around that, how the cigarette companies uh, had created these fake organizations and raised big issues about uh, child's clothing and mattresses and things, and they all should have, all of our furniture now has flame, flame retardant in it. Well, they did some real looking into it. They went back to the science. They spent a huge amount of research and came out with this multi-part piece that basically said, the flame retardant, one, doesn't do anything. It doesn't work, uh, but it does sort of cause cancer. But, you know, that's, it was a terrific series, and it was real reporting. And so one of the things that I think is important around media literacy, we all have our problems with the mainstream media, and there's a lot wrong with the mainstream media. Mainstream media. Uh, but let's remember that within the mainstream media, there still are a lot of reporters, fewer and fewer, who actually go out and try to get a story. And when they go out and try to get a story and report on it, generally it's something that's pretty useful or pretty worthwhile. So I don't know what we do about that in the current situation, but I think we do have to be aware of the fact that there's a lot of people out there who consider data, who consider facts who are really working from scripts that come from websites that come from you know their talking points you know it's like 
uh, a lot of you look fairly young. I mean, when Al Gore's movie, uh, uh, what was it called about climate change? Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and when that came out, um, it made a huge impact, and, and the polls showed that lots of people were believing it. And the fossil fuel industries geared up. They started putting out their press releases. They have maybe, you know, 3% of the scientists' community that works for them uh, who sort of say, yeah, well, we, we don't really know yet. The, the evidence isn't in. The other 95% of scientists are just like, hey, this is a done deal. We need to do something, and we need to address it now. But the polls are actually showing that it's going down. And that people, a lot more people question uh, climate change and whether it's happening and whether it's the result of human activity. Uh, and this is largely from a lot of, you know, PR that's put out. Um, so I think that one of the things that is important in trying to deal with uh, media literacy is to not be totally cynical but to look for things, when you see a good story, when you see something that seems to have real reporting about it or seems to be transparent in terms of what its biases are, and that's another kind of media li literacy uh, that I think is very important. It's fine to be transparent if you're putting forth an opinion or if you're coming from a, a particular point of view. Uh, that's, that's a very legitimate kind of thing. And where I say that is kind of one of the most important issues that we deal with in the question of ethics around documentary filmmaking. Uh, ethics uh, in journalism is very different, and they sort of play by certain rules. Um, sometimes I think that they get misled by the fact that they're following these rules and they think that's make them, made them objective. I really don't think that, you know, objectivity, people, when we started with Cinema Verite, uh, recording reality as it unfolds, just like in the, you saw the, in the scene there, uh, people would say, oh, well, that's a way of capturing truth, Cinema Verite, Cinema of Truth. But don't for a minute think that it's objective. I'm standing in a particular place. The camera is doing particular things. And there is a point of view there expressed. Uh, when the boy walks into the, uh, the blown out doorway, you know, the light is, is overexposed and you see him going towards that doorway and the camera stays wide and you see him walk into that doorway like walking into this unknown future that, that this guy picked up on. It's like, that's all under my control. That's what I'm doing. And that is a point of view. Where you stand is a point of view. Uh, sometimes when we're over the years, we'll be covering the same events that the mainstream media uh, is covering. And all of their cameras, we're all, everyone's set up on tripods, and they're all looking this way. And I'll notice, gee, I'm looking over here. I'm looking in the opposite direction. Well, we've each made a decision about where we think the story is. And so it, it, it doesn't mean that journalism isn't trying to get at the truth. It doesn't mean that certain kinds of storytelling are honest and other kinds of things are really manipulative and dishonest. But it does mean that somewhere there's always some kind of a point of view and you, and you want to look for that. And when you teach media literacy, you want people to kind of understand where it is and, and to look for it. So one of the things we that's very important for us in documentary is to say, okay, for many years, by the way, in documentary, there was very little discussion uh, about ethics. But Pat Ofterheide at the Center for Social Media, who's also the person who came up with the strategy for the big fair use battle that we waged uh, and, and basically won. Uh, do people know what fair use is? A few, okay. I maybe won't digress into that because then you can't stop me. Uh, but it was incredibly important. The one sentence version of, of it, for any of you who have seen Hoop Dreams, when the parents sing uh, the boy, young boy happy birthday in Hoop Dreams and they bring out a cake, we had to license that song for $5,000. Now, if it had been earlier, 
we wouldn't have had to license it because there's a very specific part of the copyright law called fair use which says, yes, we're going to give you the right to make income from your creative materials and everything, but we're a democracy. And so people have to have the ability to critique things, to quote from things. Uh, we have asserted and won the right to capture things that are happening in the real world that we didn't make happen, that we didn't create. And so there needs to be some kind of exceptions to this the, the, the right to claim fair use. It's like quoting something in a, in a, you know, when you critique a book and you put it in quote marks and you can use so much. And the same thing should apply to media. But the short version is the big companies, Sony and Disney and those kind of things, threatened all of the gatekeepers. So they threatened all the broadcasters with these letters. They threatened the insurance companies. They never sued because they had smart lawyers. And their lawyers said, you know, well, you don't actually want to sue these people because we go to court and we'll, we'll probably lose and that'll be a bad precedent. You just want to scare everybody. And they did. And for, for almost 20 years, we could not assert our fair use rights. And about six years ago, Pat came up with a strategy that enabled us to win back our fair use rights. We met across the country as documentary filmmakers. I'll leave one of these here. Uh, you can get it as a PDF online at the Center for Social Media org. And we published best practice in fair use, the documentary filmmaker statement of best practice in fair use, uh, based on meetings that we as a, a field held across the country. And now we get them on all, the New Americans had fair use in it. Uh, all of our current films, the interrupters, anything that you're seeing of ours now that's current uh, has lots of fair use claims in it. We get it broadcast and we get it insured. So enough for my digression. But this is, this is one, of, one of the things that I encourage young media makers to do is to think about your own field, Think about the organizations that represent your field. The IDA was, uh, the International Documentary Association was a part of getting this off the ground. Join those organizations and be a player in your field, uh, both to make sure that your work can be seen and that it can have an impact and that, as with something like this, that certain kinds of standards can maybe come, come into your field. Um, Okay, so back to ethics. Let me... So when I talk about documentary ethics, and I think this applies to journalism too, there are two competing things that you kind of owe your allegiance to, two, two sets of, of rights and concerns uh, that you have to, like, be responsible to. One is your audience. You have a responsibility to try and tell an honest story, uh, to try and, you know, get as deep into the story as you can, uh, and to, to tell it well. Uh, and, and with, I believe, not everyone would subscribe to this, but I believe with some transparency about where you're coming from. There's another, when you make a documentary, particularly the kind of documentaries that we make, uh, we have someone here who was... Uh, a part of the family, one of the families that we profiled in the New Americans. Uh, we spend years with these people, uh, with the boys and their families who were in Hoop Dreams. We were filming them for four and a half years, and the whole process of filming them, editing the film for a couple of years, and releasing it was almost a 10-year process. Well, it's a little different from a journalist who may come into somebody's life for uh, a couple of days or a couple of weeks. We have a long-term relationship with these people. Um, so let me, sh actually let me show a scene to illustrate how, because the other thing that we feel a responsibility to is our subjects, is the people whose story we're telling. So one of the things that I do, uh, and the clip that I'm going to show uh, is from New Americans, I'm sorry, no, it's from Hoop Dreams, and it's probably on the previous menu, and it's from what's called Lights Out. Right yeah, it's from, yeah, okay, light, it's Lights Out. And, but let me set it up. And what I was talking about is you owe something ethically to your subjects also. You're spending years with these people. You're asking them to let you into the most intimate details of their lives. 
And you have a responsibility to, for them. And you have to take responsibility for the consequences that your film may have in their lives. Well, these things are in contradiction with each other. And it's balancing that contradiction, which I see as being at the heart of documentary filmmaking ethics. And for instance, for, uh, well, let me, let me show this uh, clip, and then we'll, I'll ask you a, a question about it. This is, this is one of the families. I think the clip is kind of self-evident uh, what it is, uh, but they were not happy when we filmed this clip. And when you see the, there's a lot of tension about what's happened uh, here. And when you see the clip, you'll see some strain on the family's faces. And it's actually because they're, they're angry at us. I would never raise on welfare. My mother and father both worked. We was cut off for three months. We was cut off aid complete with no income. So therefore, do you know what happened? Our lights were cut off, our gas were cut off, and we were sitting in the dark. They had cut me off because I failed to meet appointment. It hurt everybody in here. It changed everybody's attitude that you can have something today and it's gone tomorrow. So you know what the system is saying to me? Do you know what it's saying to a lot of women in my predicament? They don't care. What, what do you think uh, the question is, or maybe you guys have the question, what's a question that we're often asked that relates to what I've been talking about, about this scene? Did we give money to turn the lights back on? That's the, that's the question that sometimes we get asked. Did we give money to turn the lights back on. What do you think we did? That'd be interfering, wouldn't it? Well, that's what a journalist would say. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, we gave them the money to turn the lights back on. There's a lot of things in the course of this that we didn't do. But what I say, and I want the audience who watches this to understand that that's the nature of our relationship to these people. A journalist would never do that. But we're saying, look, we're in these people's lives for five, six years, they're still in our lives in reality because they're all in the income stream from the, from the film. This film, like no other documentary, was enormously successful. It made a lot of money and, and the families are a part of the income stream. But what I say about documentary filmmaking is you form, you're in a human relationship with that family and you have to balance your responsibility to your audience, to your responsibility to your subjects. And so we gave them the money, and I want to be transparent about that. You know what I mean? I want you to sense that that's, uh, there are moments in the film where there are a couple scenes that we put in where you see the, fil the filmmakers and the boys interacting. I want to give you a kind of sense. Um, that wasn't particularly significant. Now, we don't, there are big things that we didn't do, but I can tell you something in Hoop Dreams that was far more significant in the impact on that fa those families than the little bit of money we gave them to turn the lights back on. And it wasn't just because, you know, filmmakers like light. You know, we, we gave them the money, you know. Um, which is, in both families, there was no father uh, around for most of the film. Arthur's family was out of the house for a big, big period that we're making the film. And those boys had three adult males in their lives who all shared an incredible passion for bas basketball. And that had far more influence on their lives, I, I believe, than, than the money we gave them. So I think that's why we have to think about this kind of difference between documentary filmmaking and, um, and journalistic filmmaking. Something else where this comes up, uh, when we met with the Palestinian family who's profiled in The New Americans, uh, 
they had a lot of questions. A couple of nice Jewish boys come and we'd want to spend the next couple of years with them and uh, get very intimate in their lives. And I explained what we want. And I said, you know, you've got to have some questions for us. And one of their questions was, you know, well, what if there's something that we really don't want in the movie? You know, well, we have the right to take it out, you know. And I handle this question in two kinds of ways, but it's very different from what a journalist would do. With some people, and I have sort of forgotten what I told them, but I think what I told them was, in this case, with the, with the New Americans, that I said, look, we need to be able to tell your story with all of the ups and downs. You can't show people triumphing over adversity if you can't see them when they're really down. In Hoop Dreams, when this scene happened and a couple people spoke to it, is it exploitive? Is it embarrassing to the family? Uh, when we filmed it, it was very much something they didn't want shown. By the time the film was done and the family w had overcome many of their difficulties and had really achieved some, some goals and were feeling good about things, when they saw the scene, they were like, oh, yeah, that's when the lights were out. Boy, that was funny, you know, blah, blah, blah. It, they had a totally different feeling about it, and they didn't have a problem with it being in the movie. Even the father's drug use and the whole thing when he was down and, you know, sort of using drugs, and we portray that in the movie and the impact and the pain that it caused his son, all of that is in the movie. But when he saw the movie, because he was in a different place at the end of the movie, he was like, that, that's honest. That's who I was. And so what I often say to people is, look, we're going to give you, in, as I think I did with the New Americans, I said, I'm not going to just take something out because you say take it out. We're going to have a real discussion about it. We're going to have a dialogue about it. We're going to have an argument about it. You know, I will try to explain to you why it's so important to the story and why I want it in and it's going to, you really got to listen to me, and I'm really going to listen to you. And that's where we have to go with this. Um, in the end, if I can't convince you, um, I'll take it out. I actually let them have that kind of power in this kind of filmmaking. Now, with certain subjects, it's a little different. In a film that we did about an artist, Leon Golub, um, we became extremely close to him, very, very friendly. Uh, but at the end, he had some major concerns about the film. And what I had told him was sort of a version of the same thing. I said, if you have some concerns with what we put in the film, you're going to see it before anybody else does, which is also usually something a journalist won't do. They, they have fact-checking, but they don't share the whole story. We show people the film. We want them to see it first. Um, and I, I told this artist, we'll have that dialogue and, you know, we will really listen to your concerns. But in the end, it has to be our decision. And he understood that. He's an artist. He's someone who has power in the world. He was like, we did have a huge argument that in the film that we made 10 years later, we actually show the argument. We show what it was about. We show the first, the first version of the film, the first ending that we had, he said, guys, this is insane. You're implying that my current work about uh, Africans in, in Africa, these big canvases of people looking, into the, looking out into the, you know, the viewer and challenging them, that they're going to cause a revolution in Africa. I mean, you're in, you know, this is crazy. And when he said it, we were like, okay, he's right. You know, we had gotten carried away. Our own political, you know, we were over the top and we, we toned it back. But he had some other concerns around, I mean, it was very important to him not to be seen as an agitprop artist, but to be seen as an important New York artist who was dealing with fundamental artistic questions, and he's, he's political also. He, he shared our politics. And so we actually made some compromises. But when we had these big arguments, he remembered and he kept saying to us, I understand. It's all, I, just, I want you guys to know how I feel, and that's what we told him we would do. We would let him express his feelings. But I want you, you know, you guys, I understand. It's your decision. Um, let me just see if there's any big points that I have missed here. Um, you know, I want to show one other thing, if I can. Um,
transparency is important. Uh, and I want to just show, I'll, I'll just show a, a, a little clip from that film. Let, let me see if, if I've got it here. Uh, because No, I don't seem to have it here. Let me find another example of it from, oh, I know. Um, okay, this is, it's, it's kind of long, but it's two minutes. Does that think that'll be okay? Okay, uh, Prisoner of Her Past. And it should be, I think, on the first menu, yeah. And it's the second clip, it's the first clip, Irene shuts Zigo down. And what's happening in this clip, this is a film, these are relatives of a woman who is suffering from late onset post-traumatic stress. She was a child during the Holocaust. And when you see the scene, I think you'll understand that the husband, the, the woman was with her. She's an, an aunt who was a little bit older than this girl. She was a young girl during the Holocaust. And the, the, we're interviewing her husband, and he's about to give us some insight. It's kind of like one of the biggest things in the film to find out what really happened to her. And I'll show you what happens. I'm heading back to New Jersey because Irene's husband, Ziggo, also a survivor from Dubna, said he knew something. Your mother one day arrived to, to the place where my sister, uh, she, she was wondering how she knew the, where my sister is. We knew that she was hiding. Yeah. In different, in different places that she was hiding, almost till the liberation. And all of the, the girls, there was a, a Russian man, a forester. Mm -hmm. This is not of interest. The interest? So, you know what? Maybe you will talk for me. No. <laughs> because when you will all the time interrupt me, uh, say, saying, <laughs> you know, and, 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 so, uh, I, I will stop to talk. Okay. Was it on a farm where my mother found your uh, sister? I can't imagine it was on the farm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, was a farm? Or, no, this guy who took care of these Jewish girls, he had mm -hmm. five or something. Huh? Stand with the guy, it's not, it's only the version of her. She arrived in a terrible shape, in a terrible shape. You don't want the, 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 the story to be on the open. Why, everybody wants the story to be open. No, 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 why you are so Because adamant. this is the story of Zosia. Believe me, I know why I'm saying this. Tych życiorysach jest inaczej, dlatego ja ci mówiłem, przestań o tym mówić. Ty mów o Zosia. No, family stories are coming. Yeah, right. <laughs> His sister was considering that he should marry me. <laughs> because my first husband was not a Jew, and I will have a high aspiration in this, and uh, uh, this, it's also, you know, in each family is yeah. something in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> so here, we're basically showing you that you're not going to get a part of the story, and we're showing you why. And I believe in that kind of transparency. There is another uh, clip that I used. It's from the film about the artist where he's painting. And he turns to Jerry, my partner who's doing the sound, and he says, stick out your tongue. I, 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 need, to, I, need, a, you know, I need to see the color of a tongue because he's working on a guy's tongue. And I just pan over, and you see Jerry sticking out his tongue with his earphones on and hanging on to the boom and everything. And it's telling you something about our relationship to the subject. And so we don't do a lot of that. I wouldn't say we're reflexive filmmakers. We usually don't put ourselves into our films, although sometimes we do, as Steve James did in, in Stevie, and that's a whole other uh, issue. But there are ways that you can, sometimes subtle, sometimes not so subtle, like panning over to the sound guy, to let the audience in to understand what your relationship uh, to the filmmaker is. And we'll open it up for discussion now. Our media literacy is yeah. important. Um, what you do, would you, how would you compare yourself to like uh, Michael Moore? Um, good question, and a good question about um, I love Michael Moore. 
I'm a big fan of Michael Moore's. We do very different films. And the reason that I consider Michael Moore, you know, a, a great documentary filmmaker, is that you know what his point of view is. He shares it with you. There's no ambiguity about his point of view and where he's coming from, and that he may be manipulating a few things. It's right in the film, uh, up front and, and fairly transparent. Um, sometimes he does some things that I, you know, I kind of, that would be crossing the line for me. But I respect that kind of filmmaking. Uh, we have it in our past. And actually, uh, have you got that other DVD in there? This would be a good question to, to show this. Uh, let's see if he can bring up the other DVD. And this is a clip from the Chicago Maternity Center film. And this is a film that was selected to be shown on PBS uh, many years ago. It's from our what I call our collective period in the in the in 1970s when we were a collective of teachers and union organizers and filmmakers and different kinds of people, probably people similar to work out of this space. Healthcare is one of the biggest industries in the country, over a hundred billion a year, bigger than auto, steel, or defense. This didn't happen by accident. During World War II, many corporations made new fortunes in the defense industry. With the war over, the corporations looked for new areas in which to invest their excess profits. They didn't have to look far. The war had brought many advances in health technology. Critically wounded soldiers had posed new medical problems. Health care was ready for industrialization. The financiers moved in. They paid workers low wages to produce commodities that could be sold at an immense profit. So I get on the phone with them, and this is, there's a lot of this in the movie, this kind of stuff. It also follows a mother giving birth at home at the Chicago Maternity Center, which these women who were the center uh, of the film were trying to protest and, and keep open. And we went through the film, and they would say, well, you know, we got a problem with this. And I'd say, well, wait, 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 here's my documentation for that, here's the backup. You know, and they would back down. They would say, okay, okay, that's, we, we're not, it's not that we're complaining about. And then they come up with something out, and I say, well, gee, I think, I can't even remember who it was. I think it was Dan Rather. I can't remember who the big newscaster was at that time. But I would say, well, they just made a similar point on the, you know, the evening news the other night, you know, and here's my documentation. I don't see why we, you know, why, why do you, okay, so they would back down. And basically they back down about every single thing that was in the film. And so they said, okay, we're going to go away and think about it. And they came back and they said, we're not going to run it. And the problem is the tone of the narrator's voice. <laughs> and they're right. She is the, she's the producer of the film. She is from that movement. And when you watch this film, there is no ambiguity about the point of view of the film. You know that this film has been made by and with the people who are fighting to keep that center open. It is making no claim to objectivity. And how we communicate that to the audience is in the tone of the narrator's voice. So to me, it's far more transparent and objective than a false sense of objectivity where you actually are not raising certain points or, or limiting things in certain ways. And, you know, for the first 25 years I was in film, it was 16 millimeter. The technology really didn't change in any significant ways. You had new equipment, you had a new lens, you had a new kind of editing thing. But the basic technology and the basic skill set was the same. Now the technology changes, it seems to me, like 
every other week there's there's new technology there's new formats we lived through tape we lived through standard def now everything has to be high def and now everything is digital tape is completely gone and of course we have all these legacy formats that we're trying to deal with but I actually never studied I learned as an apprentice working for other people but what drew me to it was when I saw the early Verite films uh, Leacock, uh, Ricky Leacock, the Penny Baker, the Maisel's films. These were exciting films uh, to me to see reality recorded as it unfolded before your eyes. And in the early days, I thought that it would be enough to just hold it up to the public. If you reflected back to people's behavior, our first film was about an old age home. Uh, we made it in a very good institution because if you make an expose in a terrible institution, well, you look at it and you say, well, fire those people and, and make it better. Uh, but we found the best institution we could because we wanted to show, we wanted to raise larger questions about how old people should be treated in our society. This is back when I was, you know, like 22 or something or 24. Now I'm an old person. But we wanted some, to raise fundamental questions about where old people should be in our society. Uh, and we found a certain limitation because really the film was very successful, but it was primarily used to improve nursing homes and to make them better rather than the fundamental questions that we were looking for. And so that made us understand that when you're going to deal with those kinds of issues, you always have to be looking at the power relationships. So yes, funding is a big issue. And we, someone mentioned in my introduction uh, about, uh, you know, that I was involved in the creation of ITVS. And we used to go every year to D.C. to negotiate with CPV because we felt independents weren't being funded and weren't being funded fairly. And out of that grew, it was a lobbying campaign. We, went, we actually went to Congress, CPB, I mean, you know, PBS system said, oh, don't rock the boat, or, you know, we're up for reauthorization this year, you know. And we were like, no, we've been negotiating with you for three or four years. Every year we get screwed. We're just going to go right to Congress. And, and they were so arrogant about it, we won the first time out. And ITBS is now an independent entity that is funding documentary filmmaking. Now, there are compromises built in and there are issues built in, but we've had a lot of work funded by them. Um, and you have to fight those battles. So you have to be aware of them. You have to be aware of where the power lies. You have to be aware of what the sources for money is. Uh, Kartemkin has managed to stay independent all of these years. Um, and yeah, but money affects things. There was a period in the 1980s where you were seeing a lot of historical work being done. And that was because the National Endowment for the Humanities was funding a lot of historical work and was pretty open to a lot of different kinds of things. So people were gravitating there. We never did it. But it's, you always want to look at where the funding came from. But ITBS and public television in general has written into its mandate uh, certain kinds of journalistic, you know, they're much too journalistic and I'm trying to push them in the direction of moving more in the documentary ethics that I talk about. But, you know, you, you have a lot of control over what subjects uh, you will show and what you will deal with. That being said, there are things that are more difficult to get on. Uh, and I'm aware of that. And you have to keep fighting those battles. But the climate for both people to start something on their own and to get pieces of it up uh, on YouTube and that kind of thing and create your own audience for it, I think is a very exciting period. But never give up on finding that large broadcast audience. So the film uh, about Janesville that I mentioned with this very controversial piece about Scott Walker, uh, it, do, it looks like it is going to be broadcast on independent lens, uh, and we have ITBS funding in that movie. And so, you know, it's, I, I always want to resist too cynical a look at what the media landscape looks like. You've got to fight the battles. Uh, Kartemkin was involved, and it's still up on our website. We had a campaign called PBS Needs Indies. 
And what had happened was public television had moved the two series that show most of the independent work on TV to a terrible time slot, to Thursday night, where it is right now. And Thursday night is reserved for the local stations. The, the series were being bumped all over the place in the schedule. Nobody can find it. And the ratings went down 40%. And so we were, leaped into the breach. We went public with a, a letter that people could sign. Within three or four days, we had 300 signatures. Within 10 days, we had like 1,500 signatures, mostly from, and some big names, Bill Moyers, other people were signing on to this thing. We were tweeting about it. We were in social media. Tim Horsberg, who is uh, Cartemquin's communications director, half the stuff he was doing, I don't even understand. But we were out there with this issue. And within two weeks, negotiations had been reopened, and I was on this panel uh, that we had gotten together in conjunction with the IDA to sort of talk about next steps and strategy in the conflict that we're engaged in. By the time the panel happened, they had moved the series. Uh, I think once it's done this summer, both series are going to be on Monday night. It's a very good time. Uh, and everybody was happy with it, so it, it wound up being more of a, a celebration of a victory. But one of the questions somebody asked me was a version of a question that I got many years ago, and, and somebody said, because this was about PBS, somebody said, what is I, they were saying to the people from Independent Lens and POV, what do you guys want? Tell us what you're looking for. You know, what does is, what is PBS want? And they both tried to answer the question as best they could based on their guidelines and what's on their website. And then I jumped in and I said, you know, that's the wrong question. I'm coming back to your point. And somebody asked me that years ago. They said, what does PBS want? I said, wrong question. What is the story that you want to tell? What we look for when I talk to a filmmaker about a project, one of the key ingredients is I want to know who has the passion for it who feels that this is the story that they have to tell. And ultimately, that's what PBS is going to want, or certainly that's what Independent Lens and POV is going to want. And both of the, the heads of those two series who were on the panel with me said, yes, he's right. That's what we want. We want the stories that are really important that you think need to be told. And so I guess that's... That's my advice that, you know, that's what Cartempwin has done and what we try to encourage in the, in the younger people who work with us, which is, you know, it's, it's not like you don't make compromises along the way, but at least start with the passion and stick to your guns and fight for what you think is a good, honest portrayal. And be honest with people. Be honest with your subjects and be honest with uh, your um, audience. Thanks. Thank you.